Check, check. Can you hear me? All right. Hello, everyone. How's it going? It's good to see you all. I know some of you are just coming in. We do have a couple or just one little handout. And so if you didn't get one, Jenna's got some more in the back. So feel free to grab some more if you need. Well, so glad to be here with all of you and so excited to see everyone here and everyone online. My name is Brittany Tierney and I am on the women's ministry team here at Life Community Church. And I've been coming to this church for almost a year and a half now and it's just been such a joy to get plugged in here at the church. And honestly, it's such an honor to be here this evening to share with you the word of God and I'm just count it all joy to be able to be here with all of you. All right, so before we jump into this evening's message, I'd love to go ahead and open us up in prayer. So let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord God, I thank you, Lord, um, just for who you are, God, for your love, God, for your kindness, God. Lord, that you have forgiven us, God, that you are merciful, that you are gracious, Lord. Lord, that you are the Prince of Peace, God, that you are our King of Kings, Lord. And Lord, I just pray just that in this evening, Lord, just for those of us, Lord, who know you, God, I ask that you will reveal a new aspect of your character, God, reveal to us a new part of your truth and promise to us, Lord. And for those of you, those of us here who don't know you, Lord, I ask God that you will open their, their eyes and the eyes of their hearts, God, to see your truth, Lord. And Lord, I pray that they will come to know you as their Lord and their Savior, Lord. And Lord, I pray for the kids next door, Lord. I pray just that you will be with them this evening, God, that they will know your love, Lord. Lord, I pray that it won't be my words spoken, Lord, but your words spoken, Lord. Lord, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, welcome. It's good to see you. So tonight, I am super excited to share with you uh, in the book of Thessalonians, chapter 4. And specifically tonight, I wanted to have it kind of be interactive, hence the the notes. There's a lot of content in this chapter, and I figured what's the easiest way to make it kind of cohesive and clear, so I figured, well, hey, how about we do some notes to make it a little easier? And I feel like there's enough information in here for like four messages, so I figured... Let's just make it like a four-hour evening, so I hope you're all okay with that. So get your pillow out, so there we go. (laughs) No, don't worry. We won't be there for four hours, maybe like 40 minutes. All right, and then also this evening is going to be interactive because, of course, I'll be talking, but I want you all to interact too. So there's going to be some time where I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you all to shout out the answer, and even if you don't know the answer, you can still shout out what you think it is. So... Let's go ahead and start off with some questions. We're going to be looking at kind of like the recap and background of where we've been so far. We're about halfway through our series now. And so the first question to kind of review, the first question is, as we think about the books of Thessalonians, first and second, who is the author? Paul. Hey, 100%. Nice job, everyone. All right, that's it. Thanks. (laughs) All right, second question. Who were these letters written to? Yeah, the Thessalonians, the church of Thessalonica, and of course, all believers. So we too can learn from these letters as well. And then one more question for you all. This one has multiple answers, so you're for sure going to get this one right. What do you think is the purpose of these letters that Paul wrote? Encourage, exactly. Awareness, yeah. So, yeah, encouragement. So to strengthen, encourage the Thessalonians, especially because they were new in their walk with the Lord. So awesome job, everyone. Nice job, 100% to everyone. So a little bit more background just to kind of where we've been. Again, we're about halfway through. So we've gone through the background and the history of the Thessalonians. We've also learned the heart of Paul. We've learned of the faith of the Thessalonians. And we've also heard of the concern that Paul had because he wasn't able to be with them. So he sent Timothy to go and to check in on this church. And Timothy came back with the good news saying that they are walking strong in their faith. And so Paul was also encouraged. 
So we're going to continue on in that tonight as we go through Thessalonians 4 this evening. And so this evening we're going to be looking at this passage. We're first going to look at how Paul starts this chapter and how he ends it and the connection between the two. And then from there we're going to be looking at this chapter in two sections. The first section is going to be how we ought to live. And then the second section is going to be our future hope. All right, so everyone, if you want to go ahead and grab your Bibles out, if you have them, or you can scroll to it on your phone if you've got that too. Again, it's going to be Thessalonians 4, and we're going to be reading right now, we're just going to be doing that first verse and that last verse. So, that first verse, it says, Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. So that's verse 1, and then verse 18. So encourage each other with these words. So that's how Paul starts and how he finishes. Do you see similarities in the two? What what are some of the similarities that you see in those two? Encouragement, do you guys see that? Yeah, okay, yeah. So as we look... We see that he's talking about, in that first verse, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in the way that pleases God as we have taught you. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. And again, in 18, so encourage each other with these words. So being able to see that repeat and how Paul starts and how he ends, we can see that this should be one of the key takeaways that we get from this letter. So in that first First little spot on your papers, the key takeaway is to be encouraged. But then to dive into this a little bit more, I had some fun in word search. So don't mind me as I get a little nerdy on this word encourage. I was like, hmm, I think there's a little more behind this. So let's see. So the definition, one of the definitions for encourage says to inspire with courage, spirit, and hope to spur on. So as I look at these two verses in the sense of encouragement, I realize that Paul really actually used two types of encouragement here. So looking at verse 1, we see that he says encouragement um, a couple times. And as you read this verse in different translations, in ESV and NIV, that word encouragement, it can actually be used as to ask, to urge. And so we can see in this sense of encouragement. He's encouraging us to do something. He's asking us to do something. He's urging us to do something. So in that sense, this is an encouragement that takes action. So you can see that that second point on your handout, encouragement to take action through obedience. So that sense of action carries on verses 1 through 12. So Paul is encouraging us to do something. We'll dive into that more in a minute. And then looking down at verse 18, we again see the word encourage, but this encourage takes another form. This encouragement takes the form of hope. So that second uh, second spot there says encourage and hope of the future. So it says encourage each other with these words. And each of the three translations I read each used the word encourage in this verse. And so it says so encourage the so can also be translated to therefore. So we look to see why is the therefore, what's it there for? Why is it there? So we look right before it and it says, then we will be with the Lord forever. So in that sense, we are told of a hope. So we can see that we are to be encouraged by this hope that's to come. All right, so does that make sense? So we have that first form of encouragement and sense of action, which carries through verse 1 through verse 12. And then we have that second sense of encouragement, which is the encouragement of the hope to come, which is going to be in verse 13 through the end of the chapter. So have, ever, have any of you ever asked yourself, what's the will for my life? What's the calling for my life? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? What should my goals be? Have any of you ever had that? 
Okay, I'm not the only one. Cool. A few of you haven't, so that's awesome. I need to learn from you. Okay, so something that I noticed just growing up, particularly when I got to college, everyone's asking, like, oh, what's your calling? What are you going to do with your life? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out myself. And so then realizing, okay, well, from a worldly sense, everyone's asking, like, what about you? What are you going to do? And it's all you, 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 you. And so then from a biblical perspective, I'm like, okay, Lord, what's your calling for my life? What's your will for my life? And I found that I kind of got in this cycle where I was just kind of standing there or sitting there being like, Lord, what's your will for my life? What's the calling for my life? And not saying that those things are bad, not to say it's bad to come to the Lord and ask him, Lord, what's your will? What's, what's your call for my life? But when you replace that constant circulation of, Lord, what is it, what is it, what is it? And when you replace that in replacement of the word, that's where it becomes an issue. The Lord's like, Brittany, have you been reading my word? I've told you aspects of what your will is, what my will is for your life, what my call is for your life. Have you not been reading it? And I'm like, oh, Lord, I have been, but I didn't actually apply it. I was hoping to be like written in the sky, like, Brittany, go and be an astronaut or something like that. And I realized, Lord, how sweet you are to remind me how often we can get caught up in that circle in our heads of, Lord, what's your call, what's your will, and realizing the Lord has so kindly, he has told us, Aspects of what he wants for us, his call, his will. What should our goals be? And so with that, it's like we have the word of God. So let's turn to see what does the Lord say about his will and his call for our lives. So jumping into that first section, which is how we ought to live our lives. Let's go ahead and read. It's going to be that first large section of verse 1 through 12, and let's see what the Lord says of how we ought to live our lives and what he calls for us to do. So finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. For you remember what we taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. God's will is for you to be holy so stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passions like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Never harm or cheat a Christian brother in this matter by violating his wife, for the Lord avenges all such sins. As we have solemnly warned you before, God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Indeed, you already show your love for all believers throughout Macedonia. Even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are Christians will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. All right, so there's a lot of verses there. Let's go ahead and break it down a little bit. So we can see that Paul, again, as we reflect back in previous weeks, that Paul's encouraged by this church. He's encouraged by the way they're living, but he's also taking the time to encourage them to continue on. And so we can see in verses 1 and 10, um, it says, and we encourage you to do so even more. And then the end of 10, indeed, you already show your love for all believers throughout Macedonia, Macedonia, even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. So, as we read through that, and you might be sitting here, like, thinking, well, I mean, I'm not involved in sexual morality, and I seem to be obeying God. I, I can just write it off. I don't need to listen right now. I'm just kind of kind of zone out and look at my phone or do whatever. And it's like, no. It's like, here are the Thessalonians who are pursuing God, who are strong in their faith, but God, or that Paul is encouraging them and says, 
continue to do so even more. So even if you think you're walking right with the Lord, continue to do so even more and continue to do so even more. So we can see in these multiple verses, I kind of found that there seemed to be three areas that kind of stood out for what is God's will, God's call, God's goal for our lives. So looking at the first one, um, it's going to also be written here. So the first one is going to be live holy and sanctified lives. Let's real quick explain what sanctified or sanctification is. Some verses will say instead of we encourage you to live holy lives, it says to continue in your sanctification. So sanctify simply means to be set apart and to be made holy. And so sanctification is the process of which we as Christians are being made holy, being made pure, and being cleansed from sin. So when we see we are called to live holy and sanctified lives. And Paul, we can see that he specifically addresses the aspect of sexual morality, and he addresses it quite a bit in this letter. And so we kind of ask ourselves, well, why does he bring that up so much here? And so when we look back at the time of the Thessalonians, we can see that it's actually very similar to the times nowadays in that sexual immorality was common. It was happening all the time. Marriage vows really didn't mean anything. Divorce was all the time. And sexual immorality was honestly just second nature to the Thessalonians. And so Paul's wanting to address this, being like, hey, especially since, again, they're young in their faith, he's like, now that you're Christians and you know the Lord and you're seeking him, you're called to live pure and honorably and free of sexual immorality. And so I think that is so true even for nowadays. We're called to live holy and sanctified lives. So that is that first aspect the next part, so number two, is to be obedient. So we can read in verse 8. It says, Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This verse particularly stood out to me to realize that we have to know and to realize the vastness of our disobedience. We need to recognize that when we disobey, we're not just disobeying maybe what our mom said or what our dad said or maybe what our sister said or someone else we maybe look up to in this world, what they said. When we disobey, we're not just disregarding them. It's no, when we disobey what the Lord says, we're rejecting God. We're rejecting the King of Kings rejecting the Prince of Peace, rejecting our Savior, and we're rejecting the Creator. We are the created, He is the Creator, and we're rejecting that who created us. So when we disobey, we're not just saying, oh, sorry, Lord, I disobeyed you, saying, no, I reject you, Lord. And so I think when we read this, we have to realize the vastness of our disobedience but also the joy of being obedient, that when we are obedient, we are accepting our God, our Savior, our King, and so forth. And then thirdly, here it says, uh, again on your third point, to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands. So that's that last section of these verses, so verses 11 and 12. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not Christians will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. I don't know about you, but I read this, and I've been reading it for however long. I think I dated it back a few years ago when I first read it, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, I just don't think that's what the Lord's saying, but okay, Lord, if you're saying I need to live a quiet life, minding my own business, working with my hands, I'll do that. <laughs> and then I looked into it more in the last few weeks and realized that's not actually what the Lord's saying. You don't need to stand in the corner being quiet, working with your hands. What he's saying, when we look at the context of what this was actually addressing in the times of the Thessalonians, is that when Paul 
and Timothy, when they told the Thessalonians about the good news and who Jesus was, the Thessalonians were so excited. And so what did they do? They quit their jobs. They went and they stood in the streets and they gathered and they waited for God to come. They stopped. They weren't a vital part of society anymore. They just were in the streets and they were excited, in some ways kind of causing a ruckus because everybody else is like, hey, you're supposed to be doing your jobs and we kind of need you to be a part of society. Why are you just out here talking about some God who's not here that you're saying is coming? And so in that context, we realize, okay, so what Paul is saying in this verse is, Yes, to live a quiet life, minding your own business, and working with your hands. So in that sense of, yes, when we have come to know the Lord, when we have that joy, when we have the Holy Spirit within us, and we are so excited about the return of Christ, we can do so while still being a part of the community. And when we're there, when we're doing the work that the Lord has blessed us with, that we can be that light to those around us, that we can encourage those who are around us. We're not called to just go and stand on the streets and do our own thing. It's like, no, we're called to continue to be a part of society and to continue to do the work that the Lord has set before us and to do so with the joy of the Lord within us, sharing that with those around us. So let's just go over those three things. So number one, to live holy and sanctified lives. Number two, be, and then three, to live a, minding your own, and working with your, hey, nice, nice. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in to this next section. Again, so what we just went over was all that action-based aspect of encouragement. So they're encouraging us to live those three, well, it was multiple ways, and I broke them into those three sections. So Paul was encouraging us to take action. He was ask, urging us and asking us to do so. Now we're going to jump in to the encouragement through the form of hope. So I'm going to go ahead and read these verses to you now. So verse 13 through 18. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know that what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First the Christians who have died will raise from their graves, then together with them we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. There's a lot of information right there. But it's still neat. Yes. Good question. I'll kind of talk about it a little bit more in a second. So the question was, do you think that it's our bodies who will be caught up or just our spirits? I want to look into a little bit more, but my understanding and what I'm going to dive into a little bit more is those who have died. So when you die, your spirit automatically goes to be with the Lord. And also, any of you who know different, you can come talk to me afterwards, and we can talk, to, talk it over. But those who have already died, their spirits automatically go to be with the Lord. And then when the Lord comes, that's when it says the bodies of those who have died will be caught up. So they will be caught up and met with their, with their spirit, and then we and our bodies will go. And then at that point, that's when we will also get a new body. Because, again, these bodies are just tense. They're temporary. And so we will have a new body too when we go to be with the Lord. Does that make sense? Again, if any of you know differently, you can come chat with me. But that's my understanding. All right. So let's dive in to these verses. Okay, I personally have to say I get so excited when I read this section. I just feel like, oh, this is the hope. This is the future. The Lord has told us the future, and it's so exciting. And you read it sometimes, and you're like, what is happening? But I'm so excited. <laughs> All right, so, verse 13. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen. He's not talking about the past. He's talking about the 
future. Exactly. So God is telling us, or Paul, through being told by God, what will happen. To the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. So what he's saying here is he's telling us the future so that we can have hope now. Right? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Just making sure we're all on the same page. All right. So then... In verse 14, for since we believe, and when he says we believe, he's referring to those who believe, who have accepted the Lord. So this is the promise that for those who have accepted the Lord as their Savior, as their God, who've put their faith in the Lord. So for since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again. Let's just pause right there again. So we were just talking about the future over here, but now we're talking about Jesus who was back in the past. What's the connection here? I was reading it and I was like, whoa, that's so cool. Again, I was kind of getting super excited. So when you think about that Jesus died and was raised to life again, when we think God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son and so forth, Jesus came and he died for our sins. For all previous sins, all current sins, our future sins of all the people who have been, are, and will be. And all the sins that I have ever made in my life, all the sins that each of you have ever had in your life, Jesus died for. He also died so that we would not have to taste death. He also died so we would not have to be separated from God. And so when we think about Here we're talking about the future hope, but yet we're being reminded of what Christ has already done for us. So then when we think about, well, on that third day, what did he do? He rose again so that we may have eternal life. So if we rewind to verse 1, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, also known as fallen asleep, so you will not grieve like those who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, and so on. So we can have hope in death. We do not need to grieve like those who have no hope because we believe what God did here is that he died so we would not have to die. He took on separation from God so we do not have separation from God. So therefore, we can have this hope because though our bodies might die, might be buried in the ground, our spirits will be with the Lord instantly. And that's the hope that we can have if we believe that Jesus is our Lord. So continuing on. So for 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died, which thank you, Barbara, you connected that earlier. So that's what, I mean, he says God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Those are those, the spirits of those who have gone before us. And then they come down, and then their bodies are raised, and they're met, and we also meet with them. So, then 15, we tell you this directly from the Lord. From who? The Lord. Directly from the Lord. That's so neat. Directly from the Lord. We who are still living. Who's still living? There's a few of you who didn't raise your hands. (laughs) I'm nervous. Okay, I'm going to assume that most everyone's still living here. Okay, we who are still living, when the Lord returns, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will raise from the graves, that's their bodies. Then together with them, we who are alive here and remain on earth, which is where we are, we will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is so neat. Like, we read this, and it's not just some fairy tale. It's not some fiction book. Though it sounds like some crazy thing, it's like, this is reality. This is so neat. Like, this is so exciting. Like, we, whether if we die, we are instantly with the Lord. Or if we're here and the Lord comes, we're with the Lord. 
this is so exciting. And so when we think about, okay, so we will be meeting him in the air. So when he's saying that, this isn't the Lord coming back to earth. This is us meeting him in the air, being caught up in the clouds. And so this is also, how many of you have heard the term rapture? Okay, there you go. Some, of, some people are like, the word rapture is in the Bible. <laughs> and it's like, well, no, it's not. But when you think about caught up, caught up comes from the Greek, harapazo, which means to be caught up. And then translated to the Latin Bible is raptoro. And then that is then translated to our word rapture. So when it says caught up, rapture, as we know it, is in the Bible in that sense. So that's just to clarify when you say, well, caught up, that's what, the, when we, what we know of as rapture. So we will be caught up in the clouds with the, or to meet the Lord in the air. That's so exciting. I've always wanted to fly. And like, how cool would that be? It's like, wow. All right. And the other thing with this is we don't know when it's going to happen. The only one who knows is God. Not even the sun knows. The son is waiting for God to say, go get your bride. And we, as the church, are the bride. And it's so exciting to think that it's like, who knows? The Lord could come now. It could be however long. But it's like it, it really can happen any time. And let that joy resonate. That it's like when you wake up in the morning, it's like, Lord, are you coming today? And then if you wake up the next day, Lord, are you coming today? It's like let that joy. It's like when you think about a child, I remember like, the night before Christmas, also known as Christmas Eve, I guess, <laughs> sitting there and looking out the window and waiting for Santa Claus to come, and I kept sitting there and waiting and kept thinking I saw Rudolph, and he wasn't there. But that's how we should be, so much more about the Lord, eager, excited for this hope that we've already been told about, that this is the truth for us who believe. And so continuing on, then we will be with the Lord forever. How long? Forever. I used to try to grasp eternity in my mind when going to sleep, and the way I would grasp it as I'd lay there forever and 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 forever. And I'd do that until I'd fall asleep, trying to figure out what eternity meant like. And it meant forever. And it's like how neat that is that we are with the Lord forever. So when He is in heaven, we are in. When he comes back and puts out his, and he has his new Jerusalem, we are also in the new. Exactly. We are with him forever. Wherever he goes, we go. How sweet that is. So, encourage each other with these words. I don't know about you, but I'm encouraged. I'm more than encouraged. I'm so excited. And it's like, wow, to think that this is the truth. This isn't some cool new movie show or something going on. This is what we believe. And to think, looking back here, 16, for the Lord himself will come. Right now, we obviously have his word. We have his Holy Spirit. We have the times of prayer, and we can, and we can see the Lord's work. But to think of that day when our faith is made sight that the Lord himself will come for us. Or when, if he doesn't come before then, when we get to walk through the doorway of death to meet the Lord. There is hope and there's joy, whatever way you look at it. And it's just amazing to think about. It's like, Lord, how good you are. How often we forget this truth. This is what our hope is. This is, we go to church, and we're in Bible studies, and, and we listen to Christian music, and we try to get our Bible study homework done throughout the week as best we can. But really, what this is for is the hope of being with the Lord forever. And this is the reality. And to think about that, it's like, man, how often we can go about our days and get so caught up in the here and the now and the worries and, and the this and the that. And we forget that it's like heaven is real. Heaven is our reality. We get to be with the Lord forever. forever. 
I just like to keep saying that forever and ever. It's like, it is truly forever and ever we will be with him. And so, looking back on our little bullet points, make sure we got those. Number one, we are told the future so we can have hope. And then, I think you probably have got that last one, I'm thinking. <laughs> so, as we look back at this passage, there's so many different things, but at the same time, it's just so sweet. You don't want to skip over any verses. And it's like to cling to each one, that each one of these words, that is the word of God. And not one of them is in there by mistake. Not one of them is in there that God's like, oh, I meant to erase that one. It's like, no, each word is in here for a reason and for a purpose. And, and so just as we look back, even just on this one chapter of this whole book, we can look back and see how we are to be encouraged. So that last part in there. Let us be encouraged on how we ought to live. Let us be encouraged in the remembrance of what Christ has done. Let us be encouraged by the hope for what is to come. All right. I'd love to pray for us, ladies. Lord God, I thank you for this evening, Lord, and for the hope, Lord. Lord, I thank you, God, for being so kind, for knowing our minds of how we can get so caught up of, Lord, what am I supposed to do with my life? What's your will? What's your calling? And Lord, how you are to do that before we ever knew that those worries could exist. And Lord, you gave us the answers, God, that we are called to be holy and sanctified and to be obedient, Lord. And Lord, I thank you, God. You've also known that we are ones who can worry about the future, Lord. And Lord, you have already told us the future, God. You've told us so that we can have hope now, Lord, that death does not have to be something we have to be afraid of, but can in some ways be joyful for because we get to see you, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for the true hope, God, that we get to be with you forever, Lord, forever and ever in eternity, God, with you for those of us who have accepted you, Lord, that that is a promise that is true for us, Lord. And Lord, I thank you, God, for sending your son, God, to die for our sins, God, so that we would not have to spend eternity in our sins, God, in hell, God, in full separation from you forever, God, but that you sent your son, God, so that we may live with you forever, God. Lord, I thank you, God, for your words, God, and for your truth, Lord. Lord, I pray for any women who are here this evening, God, who perhaps have not put their hope in you. Lord, I pray, God, that you will soften their hearts, God, that they will be able to take the next step to be able to say, Lord, I trust in you. I put my faith in you. I believe that you are my Lord and Savior, that you came and died for my sins, Lord. Lord, I thank you, God, for each of these women here, God, who are my sisters in you, Lord, that we get to spend eternity together forever in your presence, Lord. Lord, I thank you, God, for this hope that you have given us that we can cling to in the midst of our everyday lives, of all the busyness and craziness, God, that we can look to you and to know the future, God, and to know that you are our God, that we are your children, that you are the Prince of Peace and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Lord. Lord, it is in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hmm. And then just in the back, this is a song that came to mind that just goes with it. So feel free to just read through it and just thought it was so, so true for what we went through. All right. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.